Hello, audience. I bring you part two of my Berserk series. Check out the other parts if you miss them, or want to watch chronologically, or don't. I'm not a brain worm which controls your actions. Anyway, when we last left off, a big cow whacked the band of the hawk, incapacitating Griffith. Somewhere in Vineyard land, the suspicious egg and a couple of nobles discuss the recent battle with Zod. They don't believe the rumors of the demon, but are still concerned about Griffith's exponential rise in power. Guts waddles his way to the conversation. He is taunted by Purple Guts and kills him. Purple gets feisty, but Nuts is ferocious. Egg makes this face in response. Later, the homies all gather around Griffith's hovel. Casca is still peeved, but seems regretful. Aristocratic big shots are all taking precedence over visitations, unfortunately, so they haven't been able to see Gripolith. Judo, who I used to call Knife Guy, comments on the political battlefield encasing their glorious leader, which causes Guts to ignore everything and jump into the fray. Costco doesn't approve, but Guts just wants to visit an injured friend. Nothing gets in his path. The homies are exasperated. Caspa launches a big one, for reals this time. Guts makes her cry. She is jealous of their white-hot friendship, which causes Guns to retreat for now. Ricky relates. The next day, on some stairs, Guts sullenly trains while reflecting on Cascaroni's lamentations. He still doesn't understand her. Griffith sneaks up on him to apologize for yesterday and complain about the suffocating life of nobility. He mentions Zod the Immortal to switch topics, equating him to a god. Guts corrects his delusion delusional friend by stating that Zod is definitely a demon. Griffith isn't sure about the difference and asks what saved him. Twas his creepy necklace. Guts recalls the demon's words of warning regarding his death and remains suspicious. Grisolith doesn't seem bothered though. Guts takes the opportunity to ask why Griffith saved him, a mere soldier. Instead of answering, Griffith vaguely says he doesn't need a reason, which creates some sexual tension, I think. Suddenly, the king approaches to offer some words. Guts is rude, but bows after being glared out. The king is polite, however. He introduces his brother, Count Julius, the leader of the White Dragons, and next in line to the throne. Julius is passive-aggressive. The king gives his respect to Griffith by recalling his own military exploits as a youth. Julius doesn't approve. Nevertheless, the king proceeds to state that bureaucratic squabbles don't achieve victory on the battlefield, and that Griffith's contributions to the kingdom blot out the performance of any other of his vassals. The king's daughter, Charlotte, sends out some feelings, which Griffith catches with his face. She is shy, but seems interested in the handsome fella. She almost dies after sprinting in heels, but Griffith catches her like a mega chad. Julius is enraged but Griffith kills him with his steely gaze. The king didn't notice. There's a little bit of romance here, probably. Guts seems concerned. He does this at nighttime while contemplating Griffith's vague reason for saving him. Guts decides to keep dedicating his ceaseless slaughter to giraffe's sake. Sometime later, Adon is in charge of an important stronghold used as a staging point for attacks against their foe. He recites the ancient tactics of his family, which seem like foolishness to his underlings. Adon intends to use the bridge as a choke point, which is reasonable if not simple. The castle is well enough defended by the natural landscape that he isn't concerned. Adon is smug. The band of the hawk prepares for a siege. Griffith brainstorms a little bit and decides on some flanking. The river is turbulent, but they implement a system for crossing safely. Udon is smug. Meanwhile, operations are going well. This bird tells the bigger bird about the proceedings, and the band begin the next stage of their offensive siege by screaming at the enemy from atop a hill. This spooks the defenders a little bit. Guts' is stuff is pretty proceeding smoothly. Adon is pleased to see that his opponent is making moves, but decides to let them holler. Guts makes it across the river with his troop and gets going. Griffith pieces out after hearing that Guts has crossed. The castle is within striking distance now, and Guts initiates mission turbo deception by posing as messengers. Guts goes nuts, and his entire brigade is freely led into the castle. Adon is understandably displeased, and orders that their entire force be used to repel them. Unfortunately for them, Guts sneaks past the chaos and opens the front doors. He he cleans out the actual entire gatehouse by himself, then calls for Griffith to charge, and so they do, with the sun at their back. Adon froths with rage and dons his hat. Griffith and the homies make it through the gate and begin to add disarray to the already confused defenders. Drillith and Huts share a brain cell together on the battlefield. Adon is unable to formulate a comeback plan, and instead decides to retreat on a raft. His troops wish to flee as well, but much like the Titanic, there is only room for one special person upon the raft. Meanwhile, the band 
of the hawk has taken the stronghold. Griffith flirts with Guts while everyone watches. There is sexual tension. This victory is a big move for their kingdom. Somewhere in a dust storm, Adon reports to General Boscone about his glorious battle with the enemy. Bosco eviscerates him with his furious words, which causes the proud commander to vow vengeance on the hockey band as he waddles off. Griffith becomes a landed lord, I think, is squinted at by the queen and ogled by the princess. Julius is concerned. The maids are smitten with Griffith's wiles. Julius is doubly concerned. He berates the women for their romanticizing and is approached by Egg, the schemer, who gives Julert more bad news. The band of the hawk will accompany the king during the upcoming fall hunt instead of Julius's white dragon knights. He is shook. Egg is throttled. Julius gets uppity about it, which is when Egg strikes at his soft underbelly by offering his services. He implies that hunting can be dangerous, with perils such as beasts, stray arrows, and unexpected love affairs lying within the forest. Julius takes the bait. Man, he really takes the bait. Egg makes the face of ultimate satisfaction. It's hunting time. This is a metaphor, probably. The lads are struggling, but the king doesn't want to join due to his age. Julius attacks Griffith with his eyeballs. This guy is ready for action. Guts does a good job frightening the noble's prey, then complains about watching them play around. The homies feel like it's not a bad gig, but Guts disagrees. Dorcas disagrees even harder than Guts, stating that the band of the hawk worked their dang old buns to the scone to get where they are, and they should enjoy it by good golly gosh dragon josh Cassia peeps the princess who looks forlorn she doesn't like hunting as pointed out by griffith they stare at each other for a million years she reveals that she doesn't know anything but hunting and war are unappealing griffith responds by doing this his distraction works. Casca feels something, I think. The princess is elated by the sounds. Casca seems pleased, but trots away. Julius schemes with the assassin. This little beast is quick and spooks the princess's horse, sending her flying into the forest with Griffith in tow. She screams, Assassino. Gropus settles the horse, but is within the archer's sights. Charlotte is rescued, but her embrace disallows the assassin's attempts at violence. She giggles from the adrenaline rush, but becomes shy after realizing she hasn't perished. Griffith makes this face. The homies show up to check on them, but this puts Griffith in the line of fire. Assassino. This is much too traumatizing for the poor princess. Guts screams. So does Casca and everyone else. Guts spooks the princess with his vigorous questions. She doesn't know anything. We went over this already. Guts goes on the prowl. The assassin is smug about his poison-tipped quarrel. Griffith is conscious, though. It seems he was okay all along and just didn't feel like saying anything because he's just a dramatic hoe like that. Behel it. Guts is shook. Griffith stares at it for a while. The devil's own luck, it would seem. Guts is sus. Casca wants to peep Griffith's bod under the guise of inspecting for a wound. The princess wants to join in too. Never mind. She just feels guilty because she couldn't control her horse. Griffith reassures her though. The rest of the company yearns for vengeance. Cups goes to fiddle around with the undergrowth in search of the killer, while Julep is aggressively eyeballed by Griffulon. He comments on the price of the poison used in the quarrel. Later, the assassin is scolded by Julius, who rants about Griffith's successes again. The no good criminal meatbags decide that they should play it off as an attempt on the princess's life instead. But the maid suckles a little bit of eaves and hears their discussion. Julius reflects on Griffith's passionate gaze, then self-motivates by stating out loud that he is purebred royalty and will not be outdone by a commoner like Grildip. Juliet cannot shake that fearsome glare, however, it haunts him. Suddenly, he realizes that Griffith's look was like that of a hunter, staring down his prey. Julius is shook. Later that night, Guts takes 527 years to climb some stairs up to Griffith's tower. His library is impressive. Griffith has peeped all the paper pretty much. He puts his seal on a letter, which incites a brief dramatic pause, then asks Guts to kill Julius. Here he goes, killing again. Griffith continues to explain that Julius was the mastermind, and a man named Hale was the assassin. He collected a pretty good amount of evidence for this accident accusation, so it's morally sound, justice-wise. Griffith warns Guts that this mission is different from the battlefield, and lists some obvious differences between stealth and goblin mode. Guts makes this face, laughs, then says, say no more. He poses atop a building to look melodramatic. Guts peeps on Julius, taking out his wrath on his son, Adonis. This old guy is concerned. Julius is a terrible father, though. Adonis is ultimately wounded, which seems to have satisfied the papa. Donner is sullen. Guts relates. Later, this party is poppin'. Griffith is unrelentingly flirted with by actually everyone when Princess Charlotte emerges to take some of the heat off. Meanwhile, Julius is scolded by his manservant for being mean, then looks into a flame. This only fuels his wrath. A light breeze caresses Juilliard's nape. Assassino.
He is shook, running for his weapon, but it's too late. Guts is faster. Julius is slain, but Adoner makes an unexpected appearance. In a blind panic, Guts annihilates the child, who has an unfortunately brutal demise. Guts is shook. When it rains, it pours, and the castle guards happen to spot the bloody scene. The entire palace is in a frantic search. The old guy is speechless with sorrow, especially at Adonis's death. Guts slaughters the entire guard, but is injured upon his escape. He scurries into a sewer, which is likely not healthy for his fresh wound. Gambino. The murder of Adonis is messing with Guts big time. It doesn't help that he sustained a head injury as well. The homies are chilling in a tavern, discussing the princess's party, having a good time, except for Casca, who is eternally pissed off at Guts. Speak of the devil, here he is, covered in dookie, wounded in distress. Casca yells at him until she sees his injuries. He asks where Griffith is, gets an answer, then pieces out. The homies are concerned. They really should try to stop him here. No good can come from him obviously wanting to see Griffith, looking like he crawled out of Satan's crack. Huts finds his man's engaging in some flirtations with the princess. Casca has some sense and stops Guts just in time. She tends to his arrow hole. Charlotte and Griffith flirt some more, which causes Griffart to monologue about his dreams, the unrelenting pursuit of which has led him to commit much violence. Guts and Casca hear all of this. The princess is utterly smitten with Griffith's personability in comparison to the other aristocracy and comments on his charisma. Assuming that he has many friends, Griffith responds by stating that he doesn't necessarily have friends, or like comrades. He states that a true friend is someone who never clings to another's dream, someone independent who can find his own reason to live, a person whom Griffith considers an equal. Guts, of course, overhears this and has an existential crisis. Gribble flirts some more when a maid abruptly interrupts to bring urgent news of Count Julius's death. Griffith couldn't look more suspicious. Sometime later, the time has come to make the final series of pushes to end their long war. Griffith is approached by Egg in the hallways, who wishes him luck in battle. They discuss the assassinations with a little bit of tension. Egg mysteriously implies the connection between Griffith and the death of Julius, using his words as a double-edged blade to warn Griffith about the sinister side of the court. Egg couldn't get a read on Griffith's ironclad poker face, and briefly worries that his life could be in danger. He reassures himself, but ultimately gets caught on the receiving end of Griffith's iconic steely blue gaze. Gus reflects on Griffith's ideal friendship while looking at his sword. Casca is on the search for Griffith, but Charlotte steals her thunder. She bequeaths him a tiny man for good luck in battle. It's some kind of romantic thing, with matching necklaces and potentially magic involved. I don't know. Casks sad. The princess wishes him well and instructs Costco to keep him safe. Charlotte worries, but her mother disapproves. Teenage Rebellion. The Band of the Hawk receives praise from the army for serving gallantly as the vanguard. Griffith gets ogled at by everyone, saddles up with Casca, and gives the signal to move out. The plebs fondle their grass and spot a big army. Gus is still brooding over Griffith's ideal friend. On the field of battle, a shadowy haze shrouds the enemy, probably foreshadowing of some sort. It's Adon, commander of the Blue Whale Knights. Casca's got some womanly problems, which doesn't bode too well. It begins. Guts, as usual, goes nuts. In fine showing, Pippo, Judas, Richard, and Cascaroni all take part as well. However, the girl troubles are taking their toll on Casca's performance. She is approached by Adon, who figures she will be easy prey. He calls her a hoe and taunts her with perverse comments. Casca doesn't approve and is dehorsed. Adon's pointy stick furiously helicopters around, and he attacks with great force. Casca's underlings attempt to rest her from the fight, but are felled in swathes. She reaches her limit and is backed against a chasm. Adon gives her the option to be a captive prostitute or die. Kaka chooses death, but Guts has something to say about this. He notices that she is having an off day and covers her shift. They duel, but Adon is smug. He attempts to reveal his special move, Ganzan Simpu, but Gus wants nothing to do with it. Adon is shook. He gets whacked across the face. Judo is impressed. Guts goes to scold Kaska, but she loses consciousness. Adon pulls a cheeky sneaky on guts, which causes them both to tumble into the ravine. It begins to rain, symbolizing the loss of a great many soldiers, probably. Guts and Capo wash up on the shore. Casca needs some resuscitation though, and Guts spends some time working on it. He yanks that arrow out too, after which he finds that Casca has a terrible fever. Bad news bears, but at least there's a handy tree cave to get out of the rain. A fire might alert the enemy, so body heat it is. Guts removes her clothes, finding the source of her fever. He is a respectful giga chat about it. Casca gets a Pat for being a trooper. Judo gives Griffith the bad news and insists that they look for the pair. A noble interrupts 
to state that they shouldn't waste time on mere soldiers. This guy tries to retell the story of how they heroically fell, but is stopped. The aristocrats have a goal, which cannot be abated, and they continue to speak ill of guts. Meanwhile, my man is out here looking like a gorilla protecting his young. Casca dreams of electric griffiths. She awakens, nude and confused. Guts gives her the scoop, but she is still dazed. Her wrath returns to her suddenly, after gaining some sapience, and Guts is relentlessly repelled from their cave. Casca is weakened, however. Guts scolds her for being rude to her savior, which incites flashbacks of being insulted by Adon for being a woman. Nuts berates her for being hysteric, blaming it on her gender. This causes her to cry. Guts apologizes, but Caspa goes berserk. She doesn't have the energy to do much, though. In the cave, they bicker. Guts asks about her backstory, not expecting an answer. She goes ahead and responds, though. Casca grew up in a remote place, bled dry by heavy taxes and frequent raisings. One day, a nobleman bought Casca and forced himself upon her in a field. Griffith came to her rescue, a divine knight in glistening white armor. Her angel had a strange approach to saving her, though, ending in Casca doing a murder. She was a little traumatized, but Griffith gave her the courage to move on. From that day forward, she was allowed to do whatever she liked, which was following Griffith around, a little on the nose metaphor here. And so that's Costco's origin story. She's basically worshipped Griffith since, and continues recalling tales. They met a pedo who gave them war money, but Griffith was a homie who knows how to maintain morale. After many skirmishes, they lost a child soldier who, motivated by his dream of becoming a knight, was slain in battle. I think this is an extension of the true friendship that Griffith was talking about. He mourned the loss of this child because his dream was responsible for the death of a true equal, one whose independent actions are motivated by the single goal of achieving their own dreams. Casca had never seen Griffith so depressed, but after a few days, he'd recovered and is now selling his bod for war funds. Guts is shook. Casca recalls the time she spotted Griffith centrally bathing in a lake. He goes ahead and justifies himself, saying that soldiers cost a lot of money and a man's gotta eat. Casca isn't so sure about this shameful approach, but Griffith calculated that slut money is the most effective way to earn Skrilla at the moment. He doubles down by mentioning that he feels no responsibility over those who chose to follow him. If they perish, it was their choice. However, Griffith believes that since his comrades are sacrificing themselves for his dream, the best he can do to repay them is to min-max everything within his power to keep winning. I think tearing up your arms is a bit much, but that just goes to show how passionately Griffith feels about this. As soon as Casca rushed to help, he had already returned to his usual composed self. She figures that his dream is so monumental that the burden he experiences every day must be immeasurable. That is partially her motivation to continue standing beside him, to be a sword that will slice away some of those burdens. Guts got in the way of her position as Griffith's right-hand man or woman, I guess, which made her jealous. On top of this, Guts's ability to get Griffith to act rashly during battle directly interferes with Casca's goal of fulfilling his dream of ruling the world. If Griffith dies, the band of the hawk dies with him, and everything Casca is known will dissipate into the wind. As such, she remains determined to not forgive Guts for changing Griffith's personality. Suddenly, footsteps. Enemy soldiers have come to scout the area for commanders. Guts gives Cataplexy some street drugs for her fever, and that's the end of part two of the 1997 version of Berserk. Hello, thanks for watching to the end. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe, and maybe even sign up to my Patreon so I don't have to uh, suck the grease behind McDonald's. Uh, thanks again.